Excellent. So we're now recording and um, welcome to everybody again. And um, we're really looking forward to taking you through um, this subject today on emerging from lockdowns and the lifting of restrictions, because I'm very aware that today we have lots of different countries um, on this call and we all are using different terminology. So I'm in Kenya um, and I'm Leanne Kennedy, the CEO of Thrive Worldwide. Um, and we're not using the language lockdown, but we do have curfew and restrictions. Um, I'm just going to ask my colleagues who are the panelists today to introduce themselves and then we'll go through some quick Zoom keeping before we get started. So Anne, I'd love to have, hand over to you first. And I think Anne is frozen, so we're going to go to Simon first. Simon. Good afternoon, everybody. Simon Cliss, my name. I'm a medical doctor uh, and also a consultant in occupational medicine uh, and spent six years with my family in East Africa at the end of the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, glad to be part of this webinar today. Ben, hi, everyone. Like yeah, hi, good afternoon or good morning, uh, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Ben Porter. I'm a psychotherapist and staff care consultant with Thrive Worldwide. Uh, my backstory is about 12 years in Uganda and East Africa in general, working in conflict and post conflict situations um, with NGOs and INGOs as a psychosocial advisor. About six years ago, I re steered into staff care. Lovely to be here with you today. Great, thank you, Ben. Um, and Anne, are you back on the call to introduce yourself? I am. So yes, my name's Anne, Anne Mariah. Um, I'm the Director of Organisational Health and this role supports leaders and comes alongside organisations as they seek to create healthy um, culture. Um, I'm a facilitator and coach and, and really pleased to be on the call um, this afternoon or whatever time it is, wherever you are in the world. Excellent. Thank you, Anne. Um, and as I've just shared, we are representing many countries. So I'm in Kenya, Anne's in South Africa, Graeme and Ben are both in the UK. But I just wanted to um, really set the context for today. So we do have people joining us from Turkey, Jordan, Uganda, Indonesia, Afghanistan, Ireland, the US, New Zealand, Somalia, and some others join us from Kenya, Germany. And so that's a lot of countries. And um, of course, the COVID-19 looks different in each of those countries as well. Um, and so I think what we're gonna talk you through today will be some of our learnings, some principles. And I think there are, there are things that you will need to do to take away from today in order to contextualize to the country that you are in, to the environment that you're in. And of course, um, depending on what local government regulations are in each country. So um, we felt it was really important to say that at the outset, that contextualization will be needed. Um, but we do hope that today is informative for you. Um, and I'm just going to share very high level the focus of today's webinar, um, which is looking at three particular things. Um, how do we create a positive workplace culture and keep staff engaged as we emerge? And emerge might look different for different organizations as well. What does it look like to manage infection risk to maintain a COVID secure workplace? So thinking about your workplaces, what does it look like to manage um, infection control and create a safe um, workplace environment? And then we're also gonna look at the psychosocial considerations for um, those emerging from lockdown and the lifting of restrictions that there has been in place. And um, we're gonna go through all three presentations, then we're gonna open up for a time for Q and A. Um, so, uh, so I was going to say some housekeeping, but um, that's more when you're face to face. So we'll do some Zoom keeping just so um, you're aware of a few things and um, to let you know how we're going to be engaging for today's webinar. So the first thing is video is optional, um, but we would love to see you if you want to turn your video on. At Thrive, we very much have a video culture, but completely no depending on where you are and what you're up to, you might not want to have your video on, so no pressure. Um, we would ask that you keep yourselves on mute. Um, so the interaction today will be done in two ways. Firstly, through the chat. And I would encourage you to ask your questions as we go through the presentations. 
if your question is for a particular person, just please write Simon, Ben or Anne in front of the question. Um, we may not get through all the questions, but we will have a record of them and um, be following up after this webinar and address any other particular trends or questions we've missed. So please do post your questions. Um, we will also be using poll features today. So we have a couple of questions, they'll flash up on your screen. So you then just have to select your answer. Um, and so you'll see a couple of those throughout today's webinar. Um, I, I'm going to put a disclaimer out there that we have a lot of text on these slides. We have a lot of information that we wanted to share. Um, so we are going to send the slides out to you um, as part of the webinar follow up. So you will get a copy of the slides. Um, and lastly, just to remind you that today's webinar is being recorded um, and we will be adding it up online and sharing the link out to you as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Anne for our first um, presentation. Thank you, Leanne. Um, just by way of starting, um, I put up this picture of, of light streaming in um, into a dark room to just help us um, create a backdrop to our conversation around emerging from lockdown because it's important that we remember people have been in lockdown or whatever restrictions you may have been experiencing in your country and returning to the workplace is similar to when you've been in a really dark room and then you come out into a place that's got bright light you will need time to adjust and get comfortable in the brighter light and so with that backdrop we'll be looking then at um, different things that would be useful for us to be considering remembering that people have been in a particular stance for the past three months or so and as we then begin to move into going back, they will be making adjustments. And um, just to give you an overview of what we will be looking at um, within the leadership space, we will be looking at some of the principles that we have determined at Thrive are necessary for organizations to thrive. And these are the collaborative leadership, the fact that all team members need to be respected, valued, and treated fairly. You need to have an environment where staff are thriving and experience and joy at work. Um, job roles, goals, expectations need to be clear and we need to also have clear communication. So as we look at collaborative leadership, when we look at collaborative leadership, it's, it's really more from um, the perspective of being compassionate as a leader. If we're thinking of people coming back and there's an adjustment required more than ever before as leaders it's so important to be compassionate it's so important to be thinking about your staff's needs um, they need to feel safe they need to feel they belong to the organization they need to feel that they have significance and if you can do this in a way that that's healthy then you will find it helps settle them in and if we look at the quote that follows this, this is a quote that was um, taken from um, business in the community. I love this quote in the sense that we want people coming back to work motivated to build back better. Now, I've, the highlights are my highlights, but if we're not thoughtful, so a compassionate leader needs to be thoughtful about a good return so that you create workplaces where people are happy and don't doubt if we don't walk in compassion the likelihood is that there will be workplaces where there's fear where there's unhappiness and doubt and we don't want to create that the second thing is the the thing the, the piece around staff feeling respected valued and treated fairly as you begin to think on what emerging from lockdown looks like start to ask yourself questions around what's important for the organization and please don't forget to then if we could go back don't forget to then to to have conversation with staff in terms of what they view as important we've been able to facilitate conversations staff conversations about emerging from lockdown and returning to work and you'd be amazed at their perspective because they've been in a different space for the past three months so they're thinking differently 
from possibly someone who's only looking at it from an organizational lens. And so take time to engage them and allow them to speak into the situation and what would make them comfortable and compile the feedback as you look at what the next steps are. Don't ignore the kind of things that they, they may look mundane, but it makes all the difference. The next slide, please. In this quote, you, you will realize this has come out of um, research on returning to the workplace, that it's important for staff to feel they have an active and valued voice. And, and that sense of hearing them then allows them to feel that, oh, we are part of the bigger picture here. And of course, it helps you build a better culture where relationships are strengthened. Now more than ever before, you need to be strengthening those relationships at work between employer and employee. And the, the thing is this, as you listen to what staff are saying, you will realize that they do bring in some very practical solutions as to what, um, what works. Listening to some, some, some client conversation we facilitated, some of them said things like, you know, could we close the kitchen and could we be, begin to bring our own um, mugs and things because this was an area of concern for them. You might not be thinking that, you might be thinking different. So this will look different for every single organization. The third part is looking at creating an environment where staff really feel they can thrive and experience joy at work. Whenever we look at joy at work, it's tagged to the sense of meaning, having a sense of meaning and purpose. And with this, you find that as a leadership, it's so important to have meaningful conversations with staff. And when we say meaningful, I mean, Honestly, we've not been in times like this before. And so the questions you ask need to be well thought through. You need to really listen well. This is the time to put all those active listening skills to play because we're dealing with, uh, with fra fragility in the sense that we've all been in a different space as fragility and want to create space that feels psychologically safe. Can staff trust you as you ask the questions? Can, can, do staff know that you're really listening? What makes them know that you're paying attention to what they're saying? And so, again, this quote with um, my emphasis is the more inclusive you can get, the more you make it clear that you're after a supportive and caring environment the better it the easier it will be for people to settle into the workplace the easier it will be to settle into productive work however there's things around job roles there's things around you know personal issues and this leads us to the fourth aspect where it's so important now more than ever before to actually redefine the job roles the goals and expectations what has changed in the roles? Is everybody coming back? Will some be going away? Um, are you have, experiencing a change process at the same time? What are the deliverables? What's, what's really important to focus on for the next so many months? What are the timeframes? Why? Because some of the things we're hearing is people are expecting that they would be operating at 100%, and that hasn't been the case. Now, with all the different things taking place internally, as, as they come in and they're navigating what being back looks like, you can be assured that if clarity is not given around goals, roles, expectations, then people will be there, but the productivity won't be um, as it ought to be. And so in the next slide, you see that we speak about having one-on-one -on -one meetings um, this quote speaks of, you know, line managers have a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. And in this conversation, you are helping um, establish what the role is, what's important in the next couple of months or next month, and reorienting your staff into what you're expecting from them, 
allowing them to share with you what they feel they're capable of, 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 um, of doing in terms of their performance. But you also want to focus in terms of their well-being, their safety, their sense of, of health. And as you do this, we spoke earlier about people feeling heard, having meaningful, meaningful conversations. This is what you're creating. You're creating a safe space. You're creating clear boundaries that help people work better. And finally, it's so important that you have clear communication on all levels. What does that look like? Right now, it's really important that you provide as many updates as possible. You cannot over communicate in this season. The, the clearer the message, the better. Make sure your messaging is clear. You're getting at exactly what you want to communicate. And then check the channels. What's an effective channel? As a line manager, if you're speaking to the, your team, what's the best way to convey um, an issue? What's the best way to check on them, on, on the staff? Because the truth is, a WhatsApp group message is very different from an email message. So you need to figure out what is it that works effectively for the different communication you need to send out. And then as you communicate, oftentimes we want to reach um, our external audience. But th in this time round, could you ensure that you're communicating effectively internally across all your staff as you are externally to your, to your clients and, and those that you serve. And as you put in some of these things in place, you find that you will create an environment where people know what's expected, where people know what's happening, where people feel cared for and therefore feel they can therefore now work and, and, and be productive in, in making the world a better place, which is what many of you are doing. And um, what I'd like for us to do is just take a, a couple of minutes and um, take this poll that's coming up and let's just see where you sense you're at before we move on to the next section. So thank you, Ben, for the poll. There we go. So if you could go ahead and just um, fill that in and we'll see the results um, as, we, as we do it. Thank you. So we'll just wait a few minutes as everybody completes that poll. We'll share the results with you as well before moving on to Simon's presentation. We're at 81%, so see if we can get us up to 90 and then I'll close it. Okay, I'm gonna close this off and share the results. And there we go. So an environment where staff are thriving and experiencing joy at work is one of the main cultural challenges facing organizations during lockdown or emerging from lockdown. All right, shall we move forward, Simon? Excellent, thanks, uh, Ben, and thank you, Anne. So over the next 15 minutes, uh, I'm gonna be focusing on this crucial area, a safe physical workplace environment. Uh, next slide, Ben. So over 
uh, just just six months from the first case being reported in uh, China, there have been now over nine million reported cases of COVID um, worldwide. And as you look at the globe there, you see uh, the cumulative numbers of reported COVID cases and you start to see the size of the, the red rings. But this doesn't really give you an idea of what's happening currently or what the future is going to look like. Uh, so we need to look down into the data a bit more. Next slide. I really want to give us a context for our conversation for the for the nuts and bolts of uh, physical safety. So it really does depend where you are in the world, what your current situation is. Uh, South Korea on the top left hand, or well, first of all, uh, several graphs, all with the same X axis. So we're looking at time along the bottom and the same time sequence. The Y axis is about numbers, numbers of new cases each day. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, slightly different scales for the X axis, but it's really the shape of the curves that I want you to look at. So if you're in Southeast Asia, uh, South Korea, for example, an early peak, but actually now almost very small numbers of daily cases. Uh, the UK experience top uh, middle actually is typical of many different countries in Europe as a result of very vigorous public health measures. Uh, on the basis of that, there has been uh, uh, brought about a control of, of the virus at the moment. There are other places that uh, are in some ways just in the eye of the storm and Mexico here, but you could also look at other parts of Central and South America. Bottom left hand corner, Iran, but actually you could see a graph for the USA at the moment and see a very similar picture where there's a warning uh, of the possibility of a significant second wave. Uh, we've seen in, in Iran and more recently in the US, there are an escalation of cases. Uh, India and other parts of South Asia are in a similar situation to uh, Central America and South America, still seeing a steady increase in numbers. And I put South Africa there because actually if you look across South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, still reported relatively small numbers, but they are increasing. And there's a challenge in some countries in South, uh, South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa of, of the, the testing capability that somehow uh, to some extent might be significantly underestimating the figures. So, so that needs to be your context. And so there's the potential for quite a big discrepancy between your HQ experience and that of the field and protect potentially your main stakeholders who might be at a very different stage of the, uh, of the pandemic curve. Next slide. There's been a lot of talk about preventing a second wave and um, uh, David Nabarro, who's an, an eminent uh, epidemiologist and special envoy to the WHO, just said on the news last night, the coronavirus, it hasn't gone away and we need to go on taking the virus seriously. And it, the serum prevalence or the amount of immunity in the population is maybe around 5% in many countries in the world. Uh, on the basis of that, if we stop doing anything and going back to how we were, there is nothing to stop a significant second wave, or if you're still in the first wave, a, a simply an escalation of that first wave. Let's be under no um, doubt uh, of the reality of the risks that we're facing. Um, next slide. There is a lot that we now know. We are not in the dark as we were uh, at turning back the clocks three to four months. Uh, there are areas that we're still learning, but there is a lot that we do know. Droplet spread and environmental contact, the two principal ways of the coronavirus being spread. And note the last bullet point here, the infectious period. Uh, and the, the graph that you see on the bottom right, actually, that's a, a modeling uh, that some of the research being based on. You see, actually, the, uh, the infectious period precedes in uh, symptoms, uh, typically in uh, COVID cases. And in fact, you see actually it's a higher peak of infect infectiousness before symptoms appear. We must take note of that when we're thinking about our um, workplace measures. And it's a case of universal measures. If you've been involved in sexual health, involved in thinking about um, managing body fluids, blood spillage, we talk about universal precautions. We have to do the same thing here with COVID-19. We cannot assume um, um, uh, by looking at someone's face, whether they're positive or not, we assume that they may be carrying the virus. 
critical. Next slide. Before we go into specifics, one last uh, piece of uh, some principles here, and this may be extremely familiar to you, but uh, the virus, the coronavirus, that's the hazard in the heart. But what we're concerned about is risk, the chance that that virus will actually cause harm. And in occupational medicine, health and safety um, uh, practice, we talk about a hierarchy of controls. Those things, particularly at the top of the pyramid, that have most effect are things that 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 are the furthest away from just personal measures. They're, they're structural changes that we make that take away uh, and distance ourselves from the hazard. And what we're talking about is putting things to an acceptable level of risk, not no risk at all. Many of us in our lives, we're taking risks in regard to COVID. We're meeting up with friends, family, we're going into supermarkets. Um, and that's the, what needs the conversation to be around as we meet with our staff. So carrying out a risk assessment and, and uh, disseminating the results. Next slide. So there are four areas if we're going to have a COVID secure uh, environment uh, when we're working. The first is continuing to work from home where appropriate and then the subsequent measures. And I'll look at these very briefly. Next slide. This was from The Economist, and uh, there's been an awful lot of metaphors. Uh, farewell BC before coronavirus, welcome AD, after domestication. Uh, we're in a new paradigm. Uh, uh, next slide. Don't forget that actually, even as we reopen our workplaces, uh, people, uh, many folks are still going to be working at home, and we need not to forget about them. So that's about their workstations. Uh, how long can you continue to work at your kitchen table? entering our fifth month with our laptops and our dining room chairs. But of course, uh, we need to think about ergonomics in the wider context. What about well-being measures? Uh, many people have substituted their commute to work where they exercised to simply uh, walking downstairs to their kitchen table. Next slide. But you would expect me to look at particularly at infection control, minimizing droplet transmission, environmental transmission, and then looking at those people that should be excluded from the workplace. Next slide. There are some excellent resources online and I don't need to list all the different measures. Uh, it, it, the UK government has very specific measures for each sector of the, uh, of the workplace and I would encourage you to look at some of those. But don't forget the personal hygiene measures and the germ defense that link there is a brilliant uh, tool that was set up for the whole principle of trying to stop coughs and colds with the workplace, something that we've known about for many years, about what we need to do to stop that. Don't forget the simple things. Changes of the work environment, perspex screens, seating, traffic flow, uh, the social distancing measures, and those other measures there. Next slide. There's been quite a lot of talk about the two metre rule, and, and many of us have been very concerned about it being um, replaced by something else. But uh, I think this slide highlights that it's far more complex than simply a matter of whether how far we are apart from someone. Uh, and we need to think a lot more sophisticated uh, way about other mitigating actions that you see here, whether we're face to face or with our backs to our colleagues makes a huge difference about our proximity, how long we are in their close presence and other measures that mitigate against risks. So where possible, two metres, of course, um, there may be situations where that's not practical for our particular situations. Next slide. Let's remember environmental transmission. The, uh, the image is from Toyota. They, they produced a whole handbook of diagrams of trying to look at what the factory layout is going to look like uh, in order to be COVID secure. Uh, each of our organisations need to be doing something similar. We need to be doing thinking about pinch points in our workplaces. What are we going to do about the canteen and the restroom? Uh, and the last point, isn't it about time we, we took away some unnecessarily uh, uh, processes where we have to touch objects unnecessarily, whether that's flushing the toilet or opening a door or turning on a tap with our hands? Next slide. So as I come in uh, and and... and the key point here in terms of, of cleaning methods is that it, it doesn't take sophisticated, expensive uh, cleaning materials or processes. 
um, to uh, effectively um, minimize environmental transmission. Uh, we might want to be reviewing how often we do our cleaning, um, but the, the kinds of measures that we're using and the products we're using will be suitable. Next slide. The key thing about our social distancing measures and following the measures that I've already alluded to is that what we don't want to be caught up in is to have a whole team of people who have been in close contact with a case having to be excluded from the workplace. And if we have proper measures in place in our workplaces, there's no reason why people have become close contacts from the workplace. Next slide. A key issue that hasn't had much coverage on the news is the individual susceptibility of individuals to serious COVID infection and the complications. And there is a concept, and I'd encourage you to look into it more, called COVID age, which is trying to quantify risk. At the beginning of the pandemic, we said uh, people who are older, people with health problems, high risk. It's far more complex than that. And this just gives you a little flavor of uh, the kind of ways that we would actually quantify risk, adding or taking away um, years to give a final COVID age. Next slide. And so you have the possibility that you've got a 65 year old woman in the workplace who's got a lower overall risk, uh, significantly lower than a 45 year old man. And you see the different criteria attached to those people. And that's the reason for the change. Next slide. And on that basis, you end up with the potential for risk categories. So you identify people who are very high or high risk uh, from those that are moderate and low. The, the reality though, in many parts of the world, in, in most of, uh, of Europe, uh, we should have universal measures in our workplaces that allows uh, low, moderate and high risk people being into our workplaces. That should be our aim and our, 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 our commitment. And particularly as community transmission and numbers reduce, that becomes ever more realistic. Next slide. This is the last slide, but it's uh, not the least important because I know for many of you, you will be wanting to uh, get back to international travel, given that it's, your, it's, it's one of the key ways that you deliver to your stakeholders. You're monitoring your projects. Um, it's of key importance, but, but it's vital to think more than ever in terms of assessing people's risk before they travel. And that might mean involving a COVID age calculation. Don't assume uh, just because someone has a negative COVID test that they're safe to travel. Contingency plans are self-explanatory, but it may be you'll end up in a place where the local health service is being flooded by COVID cases and your exacerbation of asthma is no longer some, something that they can treat. Think about that. Uh, it's, and the final point is both in flight, the kind of mask you're going to wear when you're going on your, in your flight uh, into South Sudan, but also what you're going to find at your destination. Uh, and it's, it's managing the risks uh, that you're going to face when you arrive. Uh, and so, so, so don't forget the concept of safe international travel. It's becoming increasingly possible, but it needs uh, to be thought about carefully. Uh, any questions at the end, please feel free to uh, ask away. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, what a download. That was, that was great. Lots of information there. I'm glad we'll, we'll see the slides later um, and looking forward to those questions in, in the chat. I want to uh, launch a, another little poll here as we um, get ready to think about some of the um, uh, psychological considerations. So just thinking about some stressors and I'll launch this poll now. So go ahead and read through those different stressors and click three of them. It's anonymous as well. I usually do this with um, all the groups I've been training and doing webinars with and there's some interesting trends coming up.
I always encourage breathing too. So maybe this is a little breathing space <laughs> <laughs> after that presentation. We're at about 65%. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and end our poll there with almost 90% and share those results. So we have a, a winner here with um, being unable to see friends, family, or socialize being um, a major stressor right now. Uh, workload with a close second, that usually shows up. Changes, uh, change processes at work, whether that's um, uh, restructuring or maybe the way in which you deliver programs, possibly. Caregiving responsibilities. Uh, we'll put um, you know, children, elderly, vulnerable. Um, I'd probably put homeschooling in there. So those are some of the top stressors. Um, this first slide here, um, same storm, different boats, has been a recurring analogy uh, for me. Um, it's, it's been very apparent that COVID came um, without any of us expecting COVID to be here. And we, were, we had things going on in our lives um, when we faced this crisis. Um, it might've been good things. It might've been a certain momentum being gained, a certain anticipation for, for an event or progress made. Um, it could also have been um, a crisis that you're currently experiencing or, or a traumatic experience that you're still working through, major, major moves. Um, I think as we think about the psychosocial considerations of returning to work, it's very important that we understand that there are a number of individual considerations that, that go into psychosocial well-being. Having said you know, that, that there's just a, a whole disparity and divergent experiences, there have been a couple of models that you know, uh, the, the psychosocial team at Thrive has been using and thinking about. Um, one of them is this uh, curve by Kubler-Ross, uh, developed back in the 60s, but we've modified it a little bit to just take a look at um, where do you feel you might be on, on this curve? Um, this is you know, five stages of grief modified for crisis or, or COVID with mostly uh, the experience of denial being uh, the first thing that happens. Um, secondly, going into this panic or shock state. And what's interesting about that state is that's where you know, our experiences start to diverge from one another. Um, the crisis has, the, has a way of amplifying our natural personalities. So if you're the kind of person who takes control, is action oriented, externalizing, you're gonna go through the roof with hypervigilant, you know, very charged, very externalized, angry, pacing, that kind of thing when you're in a crisis situation. And conversely, if you're more of an observer or more of a planner or a thinker, you might, you might kind of go inward. You might begin to step back, withdraw, check out a little bit. And that's right at the beginning. And so oftentimes we'll see people working really hard um, to mask some of the anxiety of what's going on and other people saying, I don't have my feet underneath me yet and, and I can't be productive at this moment. Then naturally we'll see bargaining, the wishful thinking, magical thinking, anger, um, and then we get into this stoop of uh, sadness and, and grief, um, which is a place that we are encouraged for people to go to because of uh, uh, that's where people start to acknowledge the losses. Um, and this, this could be a loss of a routine, a loss of being able to see people as showed up in our poll. Um, and, and, and very significantly loss of loved ones, complicated by the fact that we've been unable to have the normal procedures at end of life. And then we see a movement forward um, where we switch from looking back and experiencing the, the anxiety and tension of the current experience to what are we going to do about this, starting to problem solve and maybe even making some meaning. A second model that has been really interesting for us to look at, as you can imagine, there's not a whole lot of literature and, and science on you know, um, psychosocial responses to pandemics. Um, but here's another one that comes from uh, confinement psychology, um, a psychologist by Dr. Um, Kimberly Norris has come up with this. Okay, we've got the confusion and panic at the beginning, then we go into the honeymoon stage. This is where we all thought we would learn jujitsu and French and be amazing homeschool teachers. 
and write a book all at the same time until reality set in and we're like, ooh, this is hard. Work is really hard. You know, I'm very unsettled and don't know how to navigate here. Moving into this phase of resentment and reunion, I've highlighted those because I think that's probably where a lot of us are at the moment. And then finally into reintegration. Resentment is, is characterized generally by feelings of um, lethargy, ex exhaustion, increased interpersonal conflict, um, some uh, loneliness, restlessness, pop psychology would talk about kind of cabin fevery kind of feelings, just like um, this has to end. I just heard a quote from the WHO um, saying, um, uh, we might be over with coronavirus, but coronavirus isn't over with us. So it's just that reality of, okay, here we are, this is hard, this is long. Um, and then we're moving into uh, the reunion, um, and, and this is characterized by anticipatory anxiety. So this, this you know, two sides of the coin of hope and anticipation mixed with feelings of uncertainty um, and, and also worry about what is this going to look like? How are we going to emerge? Um, we also see something called habituating, and habituating is another point in which we see divergent behaviors in the sense that some people will habituate to some of their well-known safety behaviors. We know in things like obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, checking, cleaning, preventing the threat. So here we've been very good at isolating ourselves. Um, and habits don't form overnight. It, they take a long time to form. And then once they're in, it's hard again to adjust them. So here we're gonna be looking at, you know, what we would in the sector call, you know, like a reverse culture shock and it being actually quite difficult to come back to what feels like uh, this, this new normal. Um, habituating on the other side means that because most of us can't live under a huge load of stress and anxiety, there'll be a normalization or an adaptation to, uh, to the threat, even though the threat is still quite present. And so when you've got those two in the same office space, you can imagine there's going to be some tension um, in that situation. I've had the, the pleasure of um, you know, having three, uh, three separate meetings a week where I meet with our psychosocial team at Thrive as well as some extra a, a group, almost like a task force on what are we noticing? And so I thought, uh, and we change the slide deck every, every week, um, but these are some of the things that we've been noticing, some of the things that might help you understand how your staff are doing and what they might be feeling. Naturally, exhaustion from overwork, people have missed their holidays, Worry and apprehension about next steps, especially you know returning to offices and fears of uh, losing their job, job insecurity, um, complicated grief uh, responses from um, disrupted end of life situations, a lot of loneliness, withdrawal. Are you living on your own, or do you have more or too much activity with um, kids running around the house? Feelings of guilt. I'm not keeping up. Um, my other colleagues seem to be doing this much better than me. Or survival, survivor's guilt, which is um, my colleague's been let go, but I've stayed. Um, some feelings of being un unmotivated. We're hearing some feelings of uh, difficulty concentrating, lack of creativity as well. Different ideas about what's safe and, and what's not. Um, and interpersonal conflicts or out of proportion responses. Someone kind of um, blowing up over something that normally wouldn't um, get them too upset. Um, what have you noticed? So um, research is saying 20% of people in the UK are experiencing clinical levels of anxiety. That's you know kind of more than doubling. Um, it's actually kind of four times as much as you'd normally expect. Um, we know in, in China, there's 50% depression among health workers. Um, in, in, it's about 47% in, in Canada. Uh, Ethiopia just had a study that came out that said uh, about 40% of people are, are feeling um, clinical levels of anxiety as well. Um, so people keep saying, here's the tsunami of mental health uh, crisis. Um, so are we in a crisis? Uh, I think it depends on who you ask. Um, our perspective at, at Thrive is, is that we understand that there is a devastating impact um, financial, uh, financially, economically, um, health-wise, um, but we wouldn't want the idea of a crisis, a mental health crisis, to take away from the real power of resilience and, and the feeling that actually it's normal that people are feeling this anxious, it's normal that people are having a difficult time right now, and there are a lot of things we can do to uh, really build our resilience muscles um, to come through this even stronger. 
So here's this uh, practicing self-care. I don't have much time, so I'm going to run through this. Um, eat, rest, move, connect is kind of a mantra I, I, I love. And I also use this idea that it's not a gap in knowledge when it comes to our self-care. It's a gap in actually employing it and, and doing it. We know what to do. We just tend to not do it sometimes. I'd encourage you to do the things that you know work well for you. If you're in the UK, it's gorgeous today. Get outside after this webinar. One of my top tips uh, for homeschoolers and, and in general is try to be present in the moment. Don't try and multitask a hundred different things because there are a hundred different things going on. Try to stick with what you're doing and be mindful in that moment. Finding joy and humor. There's a little picture on the right, top right uh, of a, a, a heart shape. I promise you I'm not normally this cheesy, but about an hour ago, a plane flew over the top of my house and, and drew a heart in the sky. I'm like, that's where I should be focusing my attention. Stuff like, stuff like that. I think it's probably for you know, the good work the NHS has been doing. Seeking support early is really important. You don't want to get so far down that you need to uh, have a long way to uh, crawl back out. Um, and lastly is uh, practicing self-compassion. Um, it's oftentimes the way that we think we're doing that makes our mental health erode. If we're accusing ourselves, if we're critical towards ourselves, um, I'm here to say, give yourself a break, acknowledge that there's a lot going on right now, and do one thing at a time, one foot in front of the other, and, and be kind to yourself and be kind to other people. I think I'm going to end on, on that note, and I'm going to stop the share, see if we have some questions to field. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And um, if you have any, so thank you to those that have posted questions already. And um, for those that um, have some questions that you'd like to ask Ben, um, Simon or Anne, please do post those. We've got about just about 10 minutes or so to, to answer and respond to some of those. So um, Simon, there's actually a few for you here. Um, I don't know if you've seen them already prepared your answers, but the first one is how do we handle conflicting medical opinions, whether it's on masks or the virus itself? Um, that's from Mary Lou. Yeah, thank you. Uh, critical question. Uh, the, um, some of, of what's being done really has to be, there has to be political decisions to be made. It, it's appropriate that, that, that politicians uh, looking at the bigger picture are, are making the decisions guided by science. Uh, uh, but I think it is important to try and look for uh, experts, um, organisations that don't have access to grind, and I would, I would, uh, would commend the, the World Health Organisation. Uh, that it has weaknesses, it has areas, blind spots, but actually it doesn't have access to grind, and it's being, it's been continuing with very similar messages uh, right from the beginning of the year, and I would commend that. So, uh, as I, as I suggested, there are. Uh, you know, at the edges and in areas, there are there are there is still some uncertainty, but we have an increasing consensus, and uh, the data is backing up some of the the consensus measures that that WHO and others are recommending. Um, so, uh, thinking about masks, for example, uh, good evidence for uh, some significant value for them. They're not the, the they need to be taken in, in the round with other measures. Um, the idea of preventing you becoming an infection to someone else, very key from a mask. But with the medical or the surgical masks, uh, the distinct potential for you to be protected, perhaps you're caring for a loved one who's infected, a way of you continuing that, but also remaining uh, from infection yourself. Thank you, Simon. Um, and two more, well, there's lots of questions for you, Simon, so we'll stay um, with mm, you for a second. Mm. Possible to access a COVID age tool, and um, Maria is asking. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, what I didn't have time to say is that this is a UK developed tool, so you, you, we need to think about uh, how, to what extent, it can be um, extended in its application across the world. Um, but it is based on some increasingly robust evidence. Um, what it's intended is 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 as a tool for uh, health professionals to make a judgment call on individual risk. So it's not something that should be uh, something that um, should be used on its own. And one of the critical areas of it is that, particularly when you, you saw those sort of risk categories, the COVID age is a kind of figure that's, that has validity to it. But to what extent that puts you at, at high risk depends to a lot extent of how much virus there is in the community. So uh, if there's very little virus around, then 
then the, the extent to which you are at risk obviously is significantly less. So it, um, it, it, it needs to be contextualized. It's developed in the UK, um, but I think it, 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 it adds uh, sophistication because we've, it's too easy to say, oh, well, uh, someone's got asthma, therefore they're high risk. Well, the evidence is if you have mild asthma, for example, it, it's, it's very little increased risk that you have. If you have high blood pressure, but it's well controlled, no increased risk. Um, but other areas significantly increase risk. And, and of course, minus eight years, if you're a woman as opposed to a man in terms of the, the risk of, se of severe complications of COVID, that's, that's, that's some of the strongest evidence that points to a, a, um, a, a gender difference in terms of, uh, uh, of, of complications. Thanks, Simon. The next question is from Suzanne. She's asking, how do you recommend getting COVID-19 tests and certificates for travellers from the UK? You'll see a lot of people are offering such tests. At the moment, as I look around, you'd have to check country requirements, but for most people, they're looking for a negative COVID test on the basis of within the last four days, perhaps, of the, of the departure date. Uh, I think in time uh, there will be a case for antibody test results that might be then be used and accepted by countries and uh, in time uh, a vaccination certificate akin to having a yellow fever certificate um, but we're not there yet. Yeah and um, Simon Charlotte's asking when will the advice to stop working from home if we can change and what will it take? Well, as I say, I think the, 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 it's a dynamic situation where risk is, is, is changing. And if, if, if we're talking in the UK context, if those daily numbers continue to, to go down, then uh, we can accept an, a, a higher risk within the workplace. But all of us ought to be having workplaces where um, the risk is, is, is right down to a, an, an acceptable level. Um, I, I think we need to recognise the importance of face-to-face -face contact. I suspect as, as the months roll on, we will realise that creativity, um, uh, uh, um, the ability to concentrate, to spark off each other, we will see actually there are, there's, there are other reasons why we need to be in the same physical space of each other. That's my uh, personal opinion. And, and I th so I think the, the risk will be changing over the months ahead. Mm -hmm. And last question we'll ask from Jane. She hasn't um, uh, put, put a name but um, for who to answer this, but it might be for you, Simon, or possibly Ben. Micro breaks were mentioned as a way of managing working from home. What are those? What are micro breaks? Well, they're, they're, it's, we use it a lot with people with back or neck problems, but it's about every hour or less, uh, two to three minute break, getting up, stretching. Um, but I think I think from in terms of concentration, it's not just for backs and necks, but uh, well-being. Uh, they say it. they say productivity goes up thirteen percent when you take a short break every hour. So there's that too. But yeah, stand up, great, move, shake. <laughs> yeah, it's been interesting in various different meetings I've been having, and um, just watching people get more comfortable standing up and taking a call now rather than just sitting down at the desk. And so, really, it's about just movement and not getting stuck at the computer screen and on the same chair for seven hours. <laughs> um, well, I'm afraid that's all the time that we have now for questions. I just wanted to um, wrap up very quickly with the next slide, um, which is just to share with you some of the ways we can support you and your organization. So, um, I'll just go through these very quickly. We will be sending a follow-up email and the slides. But the first is, as you think about return to the workplace, and um, we can offer advisory support. So Simon, Anne and Ben and our other colleagues have been just guiding COVID task force and senior management on thinking through questions and um, helping to um, think about the wider context of what returning to the workplace looks like. So if you need that advisory support, just get in touch with us. Um, recognizing the psychological impact on people and wanting to engage team and showing compassionate leadership we're also doing a variety of team facilitated check-ins and conversations so um, we're available to support your team as you think about returning to the workplace but actually just in general with the much um, wider stress and um, challenges and anxiety that has been provoked in this season um, and as 
as has came up actually in some of the poll results, that there's a lot of change happening right now. It might be personal change, it might be workplace change, um, but giving people the space um, to process that. Simon mentioned this, and we've got some information on this coming next week, but if you have staff that will be thinking about traveling and um, that are traveling, um, there, there are really important COVID-19 risk assessment things to consider, both from a medical and psychological perspective. And we are um, reviewing all of our travel services to incorporate this. And um, we'll have some guidance coming on that next week. Um, but really important that you um, have that emphasis um, when you send people traveling. There needs to be um, medical and psychological um, reviews before that happens. We have a great team, Ben and Anne are two of those to look at the counselling and coaching. If there are individual staff members that you're concerned about, um, there, yeah, we have a team of counsellors and coaches to be able to provide that support in a varying number of ways that we can provide learning and support. But if you have any questions or a need um, that you have, um, please do get in touch with us. Um, the next slide has... Um, our email address. Our vision is to see you thrive, it's to see your team thrive, your organization to thrive, and it would be great to come alongside and support you to do that. Um, but just to conclude, I'm just gonna recommend that you stand up, you go outside if you're in the UK to the sunshine or go to the kettle and get a cup of tea. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, we hope it's been informative and helpful. And um, this will be re um, recorded and we'll share the link and share the slides. And so thank you again from all of us. Thank you. Great to be with you all. We can just stop recording, Ben, if you're happy to do that.